Uh, I'm Federico Faggin. I'm the president of the Federico and Elvia Faggin Foundation, foundation that I created uh, three years ago, which is dedicated to the scientific study of consciousness. Before that, I was an entrepreneur, an inventor, and so my career has been pretty much uh, in the area of uh, technology, information technology. Well, I was co-inventor of the microprocessor. I developed the fundamental technology that made the microprocessor possible, the silicon gate technology. Uh, my first company was Zilog. Uh, there uh, we developed and I invented the Z80 microprocessor, which is still in volume production today. The Z8 microcontroller, which is still in volume production today. Uh, we're talking about 1974, and the first products were introduced in 76 and 78. So. Um, then I started another company in the voice data uh, uh, workstations and finally Synaptics which worked on neural networks and eventually developed the touch pads and the touch screens that now have changed the way we interface with our mobile devices. Well, for me, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, movement toward uh, my spiritual uh, being was when I asked myself if I could make uh, a conscious machine. And uh, in those days, I was working at Synaptics. Uh, we're talking about 87, 88. And, um, and I didn't realize what kind of a Pandora's box I opened. Uh, because uh, that got me so intrigued that I started also in introspection. Eventually that, that quest that, that became quite strong led me to have some extraordinary experiences of consciousness where revealed to me uh, a reality that was far beyond what I believe reality was. And when that happened, that happened in uh, uh, 1999 uh, or so, um, sorry, 1989, uh, so about 25 years ago, um, uh, that changed my life. Essentially, that first uh, extraordinary was like a mystical experience, uh, changed the direction of my life. And uh, from that point on, I began to do psycho-spiritual work and uh, uh, do a lot of research, reading, uh, meditation, and so on. And so I ended up uh, in the, the last 25 years uh, working at the same time that I was developing myself, almost 50-50 almost in terms of time spent. Uh, nobody knows, but now they will find out <laughs> after this interview that I actually spent a lot of time, personal time, developing myself and understanding deeply as, as much as I could the nature of consciousness, which uh, still, of, of course, is the uh, major uh, activity that I have and the major passion that I have. Well, the, the, the first of all is the realization that uh, uh, consciousness is a much vaster uh, aspect of reality than I thought before, before I thought that consciousness was, like everybody was telling us, an epiphenomenon of the working of the brain. I mean, I grew up uh, as a physicist and, uh, and, uh, and therefore I had bought that line of thinking. The world is made of matter and so consciousness is an epiphenomenon. Well, the, the, those experiences revealed to me that uh, it cannot possibly be because the uh, knowing that I received through those experiences was so much more powerful than any type of knowing that, that it was intellectual because there's an experiential knowing, knowing through both mind, heart and belly that you cannot possibly be wrong. And so that revealed a reality that I wasn't prepared at that point to accept and therefore I began to explore that. And during that exploration, I realized how many blockages, which, which were of psychological nature I had, how much, uh, 
I, in some ways, I wanted to believe certain certain ideas because they would they would be comfortable. They would protect my desire to control, my desire to understand in a way that was grabby, you know, understanding in the sense of grabbiness as opposed to understanding in the sense of knowing um, and so on. So so all of that work allow me to uh, understand more deeply who I am, um, experience the, some of the pristine states of essence that are part of any human being, but that have been uh, pushed away uh, or suppressed or repressed by all the blockages that we put that are due to uh, the sort of the, the masks that we need to put on our, on our essence in order to protect ourselves from the incursion of the world um, or to be accepted or to be loved or, you know, and so on and so forth. So, so all of that journey was essential to also free up uh, my creativity beyond what uh, it was. I was already creative but creating more at the level of in inventing gadgets as opposed to creative at, at the level of imagining uh, realities that uh, you know, before were impossible for me to imagine. So, uh, so all, all of that is a, uh, has been a journey that obviously continues and which now is moving me to uh, contribute to the scientific understanding of consciousness because I believe that consciousness is a primary aspect of nature. In fact, it is what the physical reality is made of, but it isn't enough to say that. You know, we have to bring that into the scientific worldview. In a scientific worldview which is uh, illuminated by that, by a mathematical description of what it means to, you know, what consciousness means and how consciousness interact with matter and so on and so forth. So that's where my time is spent uh, in uh, uh, intellectual pursuit and in pers continuing the personal development which will continue for the rest of my life. Yeah, I think we got there because um, because the uh, we wish to explain the world in the most simplest possible way, and to uh, to introduce consciousness into the explanation of how the world works as the at the beginning of the story. Is a little bit like uh, you know uh, attributing to God the cause of what happens in this world. You know the, the Greeks uh, were the first natu naturalists in the sense that uh, instead of finding that ad adhering to the religion of that time, which was to you know uh, where gods were the cause of what happened in the world, and they had many gods, the first philosophers decided to say well. Maybe nature has, uh, you know, can be explained in terms of nature, and so they look at that, and um, out of that eventually came science, and out of that view of the world, rationalistic and, and naturalistic view came science, and science in the beginning was, uh, in part, a reaction to the dog dogmatism of the church, uh, and so in a way, uh, the church invited scientists almost. To consider a world where, where God was not needed, okay, and of course uh, then the, uh, Descartes, uh, you know, in his uh, in his uh, characterization of mind and matter being separate substances and so on, uh, you know, created an excuse for people to you know to kind of live with one foot in one in one side, you know, on one side the side of spirituality and religion, and one foot in the in the side of science. As science developed. Uh, materialism became stronger and stronger. Eventually, uh, we got to the place where quantum physics subverted all the worldview that was, you know, a materialistic worldview and revealed a world that was absolutely not the world revealed by classical physics. So, when that happened, 
then now there is room for consciousness to be considered as part of the world, as, as part of that energy that created everything that exists. So, so now science is ready to accept, perhaps, it's still, still most scientists believe that consciousness is an epiphenomenon, but there is enough evidence now to actually uh, uh, begin to consider that there may be more to that energy out of which space, time, and matters are made, and that, that, that energy might be conscious energy also, just from the beginning. So once you begin to open this view, all of a sudden, consciousness enters as not as cause, but as improving the explanatory power of science, which is what is needed. And, uh, and so that's, to me, that's the journey. Uh, so, you know, up, up until now, consciousness was the unnecessary hypothesis, but now it becomes necessary to explain the weirdness of quantum physics. Many of the things that, that happen in, in, in physics today are, are, are baffling everybody. And, and every, you know, the more time goes by, the more weird things are, uh, you know, come up. And so how, how, how can the world be so strange? Well, let's see if by assuming that consciousness is part of this world, and that many of those things that are strange are epiphenomena themselves of consciousness as observers interacting with other consciousness, ob conscious observers, maybe we can explain better what's going on. I, I think that quantum physics, uh, more than necessarily being the gateway, is the uh, cause of rethinking our presuppositions or as, our, sum, our assumptions, uh, because uh, quantum physics reveals a world which, first of all, is a, uh, um, is a wholeness which cannot be divided. And so, so it reveals that there are no parts in that wholeness. And so uh, when we attempt to create parts within this wholeness, we are essentially creating, uh, interfering with this wholeness. And this wholeness then presents itself to consciousness uh, as, a, uh, as a reality which, uh, which, first of all, cannot give all the information that is present. So there is, you know, the Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle, there are all kinds of veiling of reality that occur uh, because we are trying to separate what is not separate. Um, so uh, the idea then is to see um, how we can have a a theory, a mathematical theory, where consciousness units, each being an identity, interacting, create the physical world that we know, create space, time, matter, and which are, in a sense, they are emanations, or they are made of the same substance of which these consciousness units are made, which is energy, which is self-aware, aware, and dynamic. So, so you need, we need to have this mathematical structure that can then, out of which space, time, and matter emerge in the quantum physics that we know, and also the classical physics, but the quantum physics and the general relativity that we know emerge out of this theory. There are special limit cases of a theory that starts by assuming conscious, consciousness as primary. So many of the ideas that we have that we consider as primary will become secondary. And so what happens when you subvert this order in which things have happened? You know, the, you know even the Big Bang may, may, you know, may appear that way only because we insist in using the laws that we know all the way down to the beginning of the, of the universe. But maybe the laws of physics have evolved early on. And so what now appears as a Big Bang was not quite exactly a Big Bang. Yes, there was some, you know, obviously there was some, you know, some kind of expansion and exp explosion-like, but we need to find out, we need to understand what happened. 
at the very early part of the universe. And changing a diff a, taking a different uh, uh, approach may in fact help unifying quantum uh, theory and general relativity, which have resisted for about 80 years unification. So, because, and, and both theories are directly involved with the nature of the observer, with the nature of observation, and with the, which essentially is an interference, if you want, within in this, you know, this uh, uh, wholeness, which evolves in a unitary way, uh, and it is the reality of which, of, of which we, we are made of. Uh, there is the potential, which uh, needs to be, you know, of course there is, as you know, there is a uh, lots of evidence that uh, consciousness can actually travel, can have experiences that, you know, in other words, the potential, if, if it is true that consciousness is primary, then everything is connected from the inside. If everything is connected from the inside, then from the inside you can actually explore the world. How to do that in a scientific way remains to be, to be, to be seen. But the potential is there and some people this is anecdotal evidence that generally science does not take into account or gives any value. Uh, uh, people that report out of body experiences where they experience themselves in, in you know, visiting different worlds. And so, so consciousness may, in fact, much later, as we learn more about it, uh, be the instrument of, invest of scientific investigation. Uh, we are now investigating uh, nature with a basically camouflage reality and the instruments that we use are made of the same camouflage reality we're, we're trying to figure out. Well, well, you know, uh, consciousness is uncamouflaged and that may be the way that in the future we may be able to explore the, rea the, the larger reality of itself, of consciousness, which of course expresses itself also as physical matter, as you know, many universes and so on and so forth. But that's further out. For now, we need to, you know, we need to, to see, verify that in fact, uh, you know, a, a, a mathematical theory that is based on consciousness being primary, in fact, makes testable predictions that are falsifying the predictions of the physics that we know and provides new, uh, new predictions that are, that are going to be tested positively. And so, so if you do that, then, then the, there is the momentum and the, the reason to then really understand even deeper the nature of consciousness and see how consciousness can be used as an invest, investigative tool. No, no, no. It will, it will simply provide a, a, a much wider background upon which to understand reality. I mean, uh, a, a quantum physics will still be valid, but it will be a limit case of, a, of a, a wider theory, just like classical physics or classical mechanics is a limit case of, uh, you know, of quantum physics or, or quantum mechanics. So, 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 in other words, you know, whatever theory we have can, cannot, uh, has to make the same predictions that the old theory can make, those predictions that are already being verified, but it will provide a background, an, explanative, an explanator, explanatory background, which is much richer as to what's going on. I mean, the, you know, the Ptolemaic theory of, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of the solar system uh, or the Earth system in the, in, the, in the Ptolemaic view made perfect predictions about the, mo the motion of the, of the planets, in fact better than the early prediction of the uh, heliocentric system, of, Coper you know, of uh, Copernicus system. Uh, but it, hadn't, it didn't have the explanatory power to explain many other phenomena that the uh, heliocentric system could explain. Uh, so just because something makes right predictions doesn't mean that 
it uses a model that is correct. So, so this new model that I'm talking about will be more correct. It probably will still be wrong into some, in some areas. And then it will be the next revolution after, after this, they will clean up you know, those mistakes. But, but, you know, but basically we, have, we, we are going from, from models to models to models, and they all contain the previous models, and they, don't, they cannot falsify what those models are predicting that has been already verified. But they will make new predictions that the old model cannot make, and, and because those new predictions cannot be made by those older models, then they will be falsified in this larger context for this class of phenomena that before the older model could not explain. It will bring the old thing together, the old thing. And as, as I said, it will bring the old thing together, and yet it may still be leave out a bunch of stuff that we can only see after we have explore the new model like we have explored for the last 100 years or so, the, the quantum physics. And we have found the quantum physics really provide great explanations for a lot of stuff that classical physics couldn't even touch. But the, the kind of experiments that we can make now uh, using quantum physics and using the knowledge that we have acquired, they, they would have been unimaginable 100 years ago. We could not even have imagined that we could make such experiments. I mean, just like we couldn't imagine in, uh, you know, uh, at the end of 1700 or even early 1800 that there were electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves, we discovered them, uh, you know, after Maxwell equations. And, and so there's a phenomenon which is, you know, 120 years old, 125 years old. So, so look what, what has happened. I mean, the, the space that before was supposed to be empty, now is full of you know, of energy that vibrates, that, uh, that carries information, you know. We were completely blind to this reality before. I think the mathematics, uh, uh, you know, my, in my, my vision, uh, I don't think mathematics will be able to get to the essence of what consciousness is. I think that consciousness, consciousness is, is a property of infinities, and so it will not be describable by mathematics. But the interaction of consciousness with material objects will be mathematical. And so that part, so, so in some sense, the, the mathematics will describe a class of properties that are displayed by matter which is embodied by consciousness, like living, like living systems, okay? But also quantum systems, because if consciousness is, everything is made of consciousness, then even electrons are conscious, obviously. Not, not the consciousness that we have, a completely different type of consciousness that we have no, you know, no idea what it feels like. But so, so consciousness, this is a sort of, is quasi-panpsychism, uh, uh, but, but it's with many nuances. So, <clears throat> so we're talking about a theory here that, um, that uh, 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 indicates that uh, uh, matter and consciousness are actually co-evolving. And uh, so the evolution of matter is like a mirror for consciousness to know itself. That the critical, the most important aspect of consciousness is the urge or the movement to want to know itself. So that's, that's, what, that's what provides the impetus to creation, the impetus to manifestation. And, and that's a matter is created so that consciousness can reflect itself on this matter. And so consciousness uh, uh, learns about itself by this reflection. So that's the, in, in a sense, that is the purpose of a physical universe. Is, is, you know, the physical universe is created so that the conscious identities, the conscious selves, can have their own experience to learn about itself, both as, in the, as a self and also 
self in relationships with other self. So it's a gigantic cooperative venture of, of huge number of uh, conscious identities that are interacting in order to each, you know, serving the community that wants to know itself. That's the, you know, sort of an overarching view. When you, when you have that, then, you know, then the interaction of these forms, these physical forms, follows laws because they, they, there has to be order in order to, you know, and, the, and that order reflect the learning that has already been, that has already occurred, the self-knowing that has already been occurred. That self-knowing manifests as physical laws that those physical objects, you know, are, are, um, are uh, uh, um, behaving in accordance with. Once, once you say that, then obviously if you are, when there are physical laws, then there, there is mathematics. And so mathematics expresses those laws, but yet they cannot capture, mathematics cannot capture the essence of what consciousness is. So, long story, but, <laughs> you know, I'm back to the, to the beginning statement. Yes, what, what I'm thinking is that fundamentally the structure of matter is isomorphic to the cognitive structure of consci within consciousness. So that, that's, that's how consciousness can reflect itself. The, the, the reflection is about the structure of matter, like the structure of a, of a human being, you know, all this, this complex structure reflects the accumulated self-knowing of the consciousness that is actually embodying this, this body. And as this uh, uh, consciousness learns more, the structure follows. So there is this coevolution that I was talking earlier. And, and uh, so ultimately the learning is a abstract structure, is a, is a structure, is a mental structure, is not a physical structure. Once you have learned, you don't need the physical structure anymore. Just, you know, just when you have learned, you can throw away the book. Matter serves the purpose of ink. You know, in other words, the, is the ink with which consciousness writes its own self-knowing. Is a way like we use writing so that we can fix ideas. We can reflect on the written word. We can reflect our thoughts. Otherwise, you know, the, the consciousness goes in all kinds of direction, it isn't, you know, it, it, it's always dynamic, it, you cannot stop, you know, you cannot stay with one thought. So we use writing in order to be able to have, to reflect, to, 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 to think better, to see the, you know, see if our logic is correct, and so on and so forth. We didn't have writing, we, we couldn't do it all in our head. The same way, in some sense, is with consciousness using matter. Matter is like the ink with which you do the writing. But the, what, and what you write is your own self-knowing. It's a, it's a sort of metaphor, of course. Yeah. Well, the convergence between science and spirituality is to see that... Uh, that uh, um, um, you know, to see that uh, consci when consciousness is primary, you immediately have a, a new monism. Science, science is predicated today, generally, on a uh, materialistic viewpoint, which is also monism that says everything is matter. Everything is made out of matter. Therefore, if everything is made out of matter, then consciousness obviously has to be an epiphenomenon because you start with that pre presupposition, okay? But if you start with the presupposition that consciousness is primary, then matter is, has to be produced by consciousness, and then spirituality, which is the exploration of one's relationship with the totality of consciousness, uh, becomes part and parcel of what experiencing is. And in fact, experiments are both inner, inner experiments and outer experiments. So there is no longer 
a distinction. There is no longer the duality of mind-matter. The Cartesian duality is gone. So that's the way I see the union arising. It, it, it has to start with verifying scientifically that consciousness is indeed primary aspiral nature. So in that sense, it, it's scientific because you have to verify that, that if you assume this position, you make predictions that are new predictions that the old way of looking at the world do, do not make. That's why I'm talking about science and not spirituality in the sense where you have dogmas or believe a belief system where you basically have to go along with. Of course, in the deepest sense, spirituality is about experience, is about experiments which are inner experiments, are experiments that you conduct within yourself. In other words, it reflects a, the fact that in our own experience, reality has two faces, has an inner aspect and an outer aspect. Physics does not acknowledge the existence, the ontological uh, existence of an inner aspects. Those are, you know, considered epiphenomena because you, there, you only have outer aspects. You can only reach reality from making measurements on the outside. But with consciousness, you can reach reality the outer reality from the inside. And that's a fundamental new way of looking at things.